My name is Dave Schmoody. Um, obviously, I'm going to be talking about aesthetics and narrative today, um, with obviously specific um, relationship to closure. And before I get started, I thought it might help to get a little context on who I am and uh, what I do, um, because I'm going to take kind of a long walk back through uh, computer science history before we get to the closure stuff. So I'm, um, really quick, I'm the uh, son of an artist and an engineer. And so that makes me a very confused person. <laughs> but um, I did go and get a, a bachelor's degree in computer science and then a music technology degree, uh, a master's. And then I worked in the Chicago film industry for eight years. And then I moved to New York to finally sort of work at the intersection of technology and art. And now I'm here today. So first of all, I'm guessing that you're here because you enjoy functional programming. And there is, of course, a myriad of reasons why you enjoy functional programming. Um, one of the things that's proselytized about functional programming is the fact that it's, it helps you reason about code. Um, we see this in the domains, of course, in finance and in data, uh, data processing, uh, where you're working with uh, quantitative uh, information. And quantitative uh, reasoning works really well in functional programming because, of course, it's easy to cogitate about, meaning um, you can look at a function and really get why it behaves, of course. And um, when you understand its behavior, it's easier to see how to improve it. And then there's like these really hard, if those are the soft benefits, there are hard benefits, like you can mathematically prove that a function is correct. Uh, if it's a pure function, of course, then you have something coming in, you have something going out. You don't have like a third vector that has some arbitrary sort of um, inference within your function. So you can mathematically prove correctness, and then you can also analyze performance mathematically and get quantitative, valuable information about that. But of course, um, what I'm here to talk about today is qualitative reasoning. Um, functional programming also has a very long history in abstract domains, domains dealing with aesthetics, domains dealing uh, with story. And before I kind of dive into that, background, the, the long history of functional programming in these areas, I want to quickly step back and make sure that we're all on the same page about art, which is easy to do, right? <laughs> and the key thing about um, this definition is, is, first of all, I acknowledge the fact that we're all coming into this room with uh, our own perspectives and our own uh, experiences with art. So I'll try to make this as like simple as possible uh, by using this uh, Greek amphora as a demonstration. So this amphora, of course, um, was built to hold uh, liquid. Uh, this particular one is probably a ceremonial amphora. Uh, but regardless, that's what they're built for. They're built to hold something, right? So they have a utility. And um, my definition of art is pretty much anything that expands beyond that utility. And if you saw this amphora in a human history museum or civilization, history of civilization museum, uh, you wouldn't question its presence there. And if you saw it in an art museum, you would also accept that that's a good place for the, such an object. Um, and the reason it can be in both is because uh, the fact that it, it does something more than serve utility. There's all this uh, beautiful illustration on it. And it's not only the illustration, it's the form. It's also how the handles are, are decorated and how they're shaped. It's also the markings on the bottom of the amphora. There's a lot of value here that goes well beyond its utility. That's definitely what makes it art, that value beyond its utility. A shovel is just a shovel until you inscribe something in the handle, you decorate the handle in a way, and then maybe it's art. Or in the 20th century, a shovel is just a shovel until you uh, put it in an art museum and then it has no utility, and so that's art. <laughs> now, 
artists, of course, make qualitative decisions all day. Um, and so they're kind of like, I'll just put two polar opposite ways of making qualitative decisions. Um, one is uh, chaos and surrender. And so artists like Jackson Pollock that dripped paint onto paintings, or John Cage, a uh, composer who used um, sounds in a room that were random, that's surrendering to chaos, right? And a lot of artists use some, some part of that in their process. The other uh, way an artist works, and this is how most artists work, is, is, is through decisiveness and agency. Artists have agency and they make decisions, and those decisions are based on a lot of different reasons. Fundamentally though, the decisive artist has to know the rules before they can break them. That is something my mother taught me uh, since I was like four years old. If you're gonna be a good artist, you have to know the rules before you can break them. Programmers have to know the rules before they can write them. But as we know, most of the time, we don't know the rules that we're supposed to be writing as programmers, which is a real problem. So um, in the domain of qualitative reasoning, um, I'm gonna start by talking about Aaron. Um, a lot of you have probably heard of Aaron. Uh, it was, it's a painting robot. Um, the development uh, window started in 1968. This is a pretty big development window. Um, this is not agile. Um, so, and it, and it continued well into the 21st century. It started in Fortran. Um, it went on to C, right? And it ultimately ended up uh, in Lisp, um, common Lisp uh, object system, so, or CLOS or CLOS. This is an example of a picture Aaron drew in 1983. And here's an example of something that Aaron uh, painted in 1992. And I have to stress that all of these artifacts are, of course, physical artifacts. These are not images on screens. These are things that Aaron made um, onto canvas or paper. And there are quite a number of differences between these two that we can immediately uh, see. Um, the one I'm going to focus on was the one that really, um, really changed how Harold Cohen, the author of Aaron, worked. That is color. So color, um, color is a really difficult problem to solve even when we're talking about humans, like color theory. Um, telling a robot how to make autonomous decisions uh, regarding color is even more difficult because there is no real baseline here, right? Especially if you're starting to think about this um, in the mid to late 20th century. And so um, we know, of course, that yellow and blue uh, we mix those paints together, it's going to make green. But a robot doesn't know that. And then furthermore, um, green also has all this connotation that a robot doesn't know. And we know, of course, grass is green and the sky is not green, but a robot has no idea. When Harold Cohen started writing um, systems for color, he thought that what it would look like is this large domain of primitives and he would just keep adding new rule sets and new primitives in C and um, in the language C. And um, that would eventually build some uh, robot of sophistication uh, that could work autonomously without, um, without Harold's involvement. The fact is, of course, that's not really how it worked at all. Um, what we've discovered um, in this research, of course, is that a small number of primitives that are put together, a small number of rule sets that are put together in an interesting way, um, that's kind of the way to move forward. And so, of course, um, that's how he ended up in Lisp, because Lisp um, really works well with a small number of primitives. And so, when we're talking about um, making this robot, and making this robot make creative decisions about color, one of the really important points that Harold Cohen talked about after his experiences with this was that he wasn't making a robot that was creative. He wasn't making a robot that was creative in the way that you were creative and the way that I was creative. That's, that's a goal that may be reached. It's a goal that may not be reached, but it's an irrelevant question. What he was trying to do was make a robot that could act autonomously. That was the key thing. Make autonomous aesthetic choices. 
Now, Harold unfortunately passed away earlier this year uh, in April. Um, but Aaron, of course, continues to go on. And Harold would often joke um, that he would be the first artist uh, with a posthumous exhibition of new work because Harold, because Aaron can continue to work whether or not Harold's here at all. So the next thing I'm going to talk about um, is Zork. Yeehaw! <laughs> so I got a couple of uh, people familiar with the underground here. That's great. <laughs> Uh, you were in front of a white house. <laughs> um, some people got that. So I started the development of Zork in 1975, which is actually when um, its predecessor, Colossal Cave Adventures, uh, was started. Um, the reason I start that there is because there really is an uh, inseparable tie between the two, um, between the two pieces of software. Um, it flows really directly into Zork, the development of Colossal Cave. And then I ended at 1982 when it was finally, the final um, chapter of Zork was um, delivered to home computers. That's Zork 3 uh, for the TRS-80 and the Apple II and the Commodore uh, 64, um, those sorts of machines. So again, Adventure started off in Fortran, eventually ended up in Muddle um, on a PDB-10 and Muddle um, is uh, MIT design language, and that's also um, a descendant of Lisp. Okay, seeing the pattern. And then eventually, uh, it ends up um, on a kind of a re reduced version of Muddle called Zill, um, which is essentially a virtual machine made for home computers. Uh, here's a picture of Zork. It's not that exciting to look at, right? Um, the exciting thing about Zork is not what it looks like. It's it's how you interact with it. It's interacting with it. Um, so in Colossal Cave Adventures, you could tell it's something very simple like go west. Right? You could also say west go. It didn't matter. It's a verb noun uh, combination. Very simple. And when the guys at MIT got a hold of this, um, they added a very sophisticated parser that changed how powerful the experience was for the user direct and indirect objects, preposition and conjunctions. These were added to the parser, so you could say something complex like fill the bottle with water. This is an example of some muddle code. Um, the reason I kind of included this was, one, to look at some actual code, and two, just to show that we have a thing called an ax in this world, in this story. And an ax, of course, has a utilitarian purpose and that is to maybe chop something, chop wood, but we don't really know the context of that unless we know the story. And so as a programmer, um, that would be one way to go about it, to find an ax within the realm of the story that you, you know, but that's awfully limited because this ax might be used to chop wood, it might be used to chop a head, it might be used to open a bottle. I mean, there's any number of ways this ax could be used. So instead, of course, we have an object um, called an ax, and then this thing called an ax can do several, has several properties. Um, here's what Zill looked like, and in this case, we have a lantern. Um, this happens really early on in the game. We have a lantern, and then we have all this great metadata about this lantern. It's in a living room. It has, you can call it a lantern, you can call it a lamp, you can call it a light. Uh, you can call it brass, you can call it a brass lantern, right? Um, it has all sorts of descriptions, actions that can be taken with it. And the important thing about this, or the exciting thing about this, is that this is metadata, but it's all executable, right? So the fact that it's executable gives it its power. And the fact that we didn't have to know everything we can do with a lantern before we made a lantern, before we wrote a lantern, of course, is the power of this way of working. And we come back to this idea that Harold Cohen also came to, which is, of course, a small number of primitives. Instead of trying to deduce and write the entire universe of word combinations, we have a small number of primitives that can be composed together. The end result is a sense of autonomy for the user. It's as if we have a narrator telling us a story that we're interacting with, and that guide that's telling us a story that we're talking to in our language, in our natural language, 
is um, the essence of the experience of Zork. So qualitative reasoning then um, has some, I guess, facets about it that um, are important to identify explicitly. And one is that there is an unknown number of quantities when you're qualitative reasoning. And often, you will never find the known number of quantities, and your process is less about quantifying and more about exploration of be it an idea or an object or any a, a number of other sort of like nouns. <laughs> but the point is, is that that's a diametrically opposed method of engagement than you have when you are um, qualitative or quali uh, quantifiably reasoning. And the important thing is to allow this, is to set yourself up with a tool set and to allow yourself uh, the license to explore and not get caught up in ideas of when I make the robot or the computer software do this thing, is it intelligent? Is it creative? The only thing that matters is that it is autonomous, meaning that behind Zork, there was no mechanical Turk that actually was typing the thing, right? The mechanical Turk doesn't exist. The fact is that Zork can interact with people and tell them a story um, even without human intervention. This has precedence uh, outside, of, outside of computer science. Any art making endeavor that um, has uh, more than one party involved usually reduces to some form of this, some facsimile of this. Uh, quick digression to talk about how a movie is made and, and, and demonstrate that parallel um, is the film script. And the film script is a technical document. A film script is a technical document and clarity and precision is prized within that technical document. The specifications for writing a screenplay are the same specifications that existed when there was only typewriters, before word processing. And those specifications haven't changed well into the 21st century because the specifications of margins, of um, paragraph length, what's a desirable action block, those sorts of specifications, although they're quantitatively, there are some quantitative aspects to it, there, we usually think of screenplay writing as a qualitative decision-making process. But it's important to abide by a few very strict structural definitions in order to have the screenplay live a life after the screenwriter has agency over it. That screenplay is going to be passed on to cinematographers, for example. And a screenwriter doesn't have to ever operate a camera in order to write a screenplay. That screenplay is going to be passed on to directors, of course, so they can direct the actors. That screenplay is going to be passed on to production people um, that are in the art department to um, bring a gun to set if that's what the screenplay calls for. And the screenplay might call for a handgun, but what does that handgun look like? What exact model is it? What, there are all sorts of decisions to be made and then also the very technical process of just making sure that the day that the actor is supposed to shoot the other actor, there is a gun on set for him or her to use, right? Uh, very specific things need to happen for a movie to get made. That's why a screenplay is such a technical document. In fact, it is such a non-readable document that very few people in this room read screenplays for fun, but you might watch some movies. And in fact, when most people read screenplays, they don't read the screenplay, they read the novelization of the screenplay, right? So the Star Wars novels or whatever. And those screenplay, or sorry, those novels um, aren't written by the original screenwriter. They're almost always written by someone else based on the original te technical document derived from that person. So just as a blueprint isn't a bridge, a code is not necessarily its execution. A script is not a film. The important thing here is, is that there are autonomous agents working after we put together this um, blueprint, this screenplay, this code, to actually execute it. 
The script itself is an object of pure narrative, and the film, of course, is the result of the autonomous agents working off that screenplay. So for creating agency in our domain of functional programming, two of the most powerful tools we have are the tools of pure functions and the tool of functional composition or uh, composing functions. Um, so from here, with that set up, I want to talk a little bit about um, some very closure specific uh, material. This is a project I'm working on called Borderless with um, a New York artist named Kim Burgess. And um, it involves a connect as the input. And then the output is audio. Uh, that audio is generated by Overtone, which is a library some of you are familiar with undoubtedly. Um, now this um, experience happens in a very abstract domain. We have two figures here uh, we, uh, submerged in a large pool of liquid. That's the visual. The, the figures are male and female and uh, all sorts of races and they are coming in and out of this liquid and that's projected onto a wall like this. It's actually projected onto thin curtains. And the end result of the installation experience is when you enter into the installation, it looks as if these people are levitating in air and sort of like popping out, um, popping out of the material. Uh, Here's an overhead of the installation. Not sure how helpful this is going to be, but uh, there's a connect there on the left that's facing the projector. So the people, the audience would come in from behind the projector, where the projector's at, sort of like this room. And the connect is facing where the people enter. And the connect then uh, creates results based on the people in the room. And what I have then, in essence, is a series of transducers. Uh, with a set of inputs, including people entering, people leaving, or people in the space simply moving or changing their position. Now those transducers um, are filled with all sorts of data that come off of that. Um, so we have how long they've been in the room, we have how fast are they moving, the center of their body, we have how high they are in the, rect in the, in the, in the screen, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's just a ton of data coming out of this. And then the transducer part of it is then that information has to be correlated to some output, which is sonic. And so it is fundamentally based on uh, timbre, loudness, and pitch. Uh, but there are all sorts of ways to manipulate those um, qualities uh, within Overtone or any synthetic or any synthesizer. Um, this is kind of what it looks like uh, on the cockpit. Um, so this is sort of, this is not the installation, but this is, the, this is what's running the installation. Um, on the left, of course, is a REPL um, with some of the code above it. On the right is what the connect is seeing. This is a quick 23 second demo of it. So a person enters on the right, and then someone enters on the left, and you can see the REPL responding to that. They have sounds correlated to what they're doing, uh, and then maybe someone comes in on the right again, and within the REPL in real time, of course, I can uh, see what sort of sound is attached to that person, right? So the fundamental flow then of this software then is some input from the connect, a delta within closure that, uh, that works with that data that operates on some primitives that we'll talk about that I defined. And then finally, um, the output is some sound. So the sort of operations that are happening under the hood, I won't sort of dive in you know, deeply into them, but um, just to give you a sense of what's going on, um, you know, I have someone coming in um, and they're added to a set of atoms. Um, that atom set has an ID number for a person and then a vowel that's attached to them. The vowel is sort of the basis of the soundscapes that we generate. And then maybe within that frame, uh, if they start moving, if they update their position, um, then I get their age. I get some other parameters, but this is, I get their age or how long they've been there, not their, you know, 
not how old they are, but how long they've been on screen, right? And if that element exists within the atom here on the penultimate line there, if the element exists within the atom, which they do, um, then I'm going to map some of that information coming from the connect onto the amplitude, onto the amount of reverb that I hear, onto the oscillator, which is the pitch. So that's the fundamental, that's the gist of what's going on. And the thing is, is this is not a simple operation. This is actually, um, breeds quite a bit of complexity. This is actually a function from the software and you just look at it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not, you don't walk up to a function like this and say, oh, I grok ya, you know. Um, it takes a while of reading and understanding and there's a lot of parameters going in. And so, um, it's really hard to abide by this qualitative reasoning aspect of art, which is knowing the rules before you break them. I can't walk up to a function like that, grok it, and say, okay, I got what you're doing. Now I'm gonna make some intelligent decisions because this thing is kind of fat. <laughs> so that's one problem with this. Um, the other thing is that within the world of closure, it's boundless, meaning that I could do anything to any number. And so another rule of art making, of qualitative reasoning, is that constraints breed creativity. Working without bounds will give you um, a mess on the other side. Uh, the last rule of art making that I'll set out there today is um, trust your instinct. And again, coming to a function like that, thinking you grok it, and then instinctually making a couple changes to a couple numbers, that's not the same thing as like looking at a painting and then making some kind of intelligent decision about, well, this should obviously be red and this should obviously be blue because that's how I paint. Um, so in this regard, the REPL is God, of course, because you can do something akin to that where you can just experiment. You can instinctually just try some numbers, get some sounds, all real time, play. Play is an important part of engineering and an important part of art, especially in the domain of, of qualitative reasoning. So this brings me to um, a way to also then, so if the REPL is a way for us to experiment with our instincts, this brings me to a way to create constraints for us to work within, and that's using spec. Um, spec is, of course, great for creating um, known constraints or scientific constraints, meaning um, this particular spec from the software um, has a range of 20 to two, uh, 20 kilohertz, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, which is um, the range of human hearing. So I know uh, I can create a data type uh, that goes from 20 to 20,000 because um, there's no reason to have a frequency uh, above or below that. But also, spec is a great way to create aesthetic constraints. So when I sit down, if I know a few things about synthesis, I know a few things about sound, I know a few things about what I want it to sound like, I can sit down and write, literally write down my presumptions and experiment off those presumptions. Um, how much reverb do I want in this piece? Do I want this piece to sound like it's in a cave? Do I want it to sound like it's in this room with all that slapback reverb? Or do I want something more subtle? Well, if I want something more subtle, I can create a constraint, like the second one there, with a smaller control range with those numbers that mean something to overtone, that means something about um, knowing, the, knowing the hardware or knowing the software and how it's implemented, uh, the reverb. Knowing something about the reverb, I can make intelligent decisions about what those constraints might be. I can also know if it's a number or an integer or a float. And so spec gives me a way then to, I suppose, test my code. But testing qualitative decision making doesn't make a lot of sense. Even if I generate values and plug them into the synthesizer, into the noise maker, that's not really testing, that's experimenting. So spec 
Yes, it gives you like creating specs gives you testable code, but in the domain of qualitative reasoning, it gives you experimentable, that's my new word, code. The other thing then that spec gives me down the line, and functional programming then in more general sense, is a way to create constraints for the machine to operate off of so that the machine can make autonomous decision making or make autonomous decisions. And so this is pretty b valuable for borderless because borderless is an installation. We had an installation recently in Canada of the piece. And that piece is going to be running over a long period of time. And so there are a number of environmental variables that can change depending on, depending on time of day or it can change depending on uh, maybe it mutates, it can mutate so the experience isn't always the same and the same notes and the same things don't always happen. It changes depending on if there's a large crowd of people or a small number of people, if there's up times or down times where there's a lot of people or few people. So it allows the machine, it gives constraints to the machine to make autonomous decisions and self-modify or mutate its code. So before I wrap up, I want to take one, uh, make one last note about um, autonomy and the idea of authorship. Because we live sort of in um, a milieu of, of thinking that um, we aspire, I think, quite often for quantitative, um, for quantitative outcomes. Things that are easy to work with with a computer. Entire industries, of course, are based on that. And there is um, a sense that the results that come out of this machine, of course, are somehow unbiased or somehow objective. And of course, I don't necessarily agree with that. Even if the machine mutates itself, it's always going to be imbued with some strand of DNA of the authorship of its creator. The person who wrote that algorithm is a human being. And that human being is filled with bias. And as long as these things come out of human beings' hands, these machines will have implicit biases. And of course, this has major ramifications well into the future as we hand off more decision making over to machines. So this idea that objectivity in the last, th uh, last several decades in computer science is some sort of brass ring that we should aspire as a culture, as a computing culture to, to uh, achieve um, is something that I think overshadows, it's something that's great, but it's also something that overshadows the value of imbuing or allowing a computer to make subjective qualitative decisions and the outcomes of that. So in this talk, of course, you know, there's been plenty of examples of qualitative and subjective reasoning uh, by machines. Um, but the major thrust of research or the major thrust of industry isn't necessarily in that domain. And that says something about us as an entire culture of people that work in computing. And as my last point of evidence on that, or as my point of evidence on that, uh, again, I go back to the Greek amphora. And the reason that this amphora is priceless, the reason that it's incredibly valuable, is not because uh, it can carry water. The fact that it has utility, the fact that we make machines with utility, isn't necessarily what makes machines valuable. The thing that makes us valuable over the thousands and thousands of years that it has existed is the qualitative, the qualitative decision making that went into making this amphora. So that is something that we know has value and it's something that we can adopt within our own culture of computation, qualitative reasoning. So at the end, um, leaving you with just a little bit of a thought about like where this can lead, of course, this can lead into domains, well, any liberal arts domain in computation, into journalism, into personal assistance. I mean, there are all sorts of domains where qualitative values have a major import 
And that's kind of what I think that we as a community should as aspire to, uh, in a larger part at least than what we are today. Okay, so my name's Dave Schmoody. Obviously, I like to talk about big ideas, so um, find me on Twitter, or even better yet, uh, let's talk in person at the Conj. Thanks for being here.